I finished the main storyline of Prince of Persia The Lost Crown and I've played over 30 hours so far so I'm going to share some of the things that I'd wish I'd known sooner before playing the game so you can hopefully have a more enjoyable experience with a little less head scratching. Now no main storyline spoilers here and my thanks to Ubisoft for slinging me across a review code and sponsoring this video so I can get these tips and tricks out to you very swiftly. And let's go over some exploration restrictions first because this is a Metroidvania style game which means there isn't a single linear path to reach 100% completion because as you progress through the story you will then unlock six time powers which will then allow you to return to certain areas that you couldn't enter at the start of your playthrough. An example of this in action are the golden boulder doors as you can see here which is one of the first things that you will actually pass by when you do reach Mount Calf early on in the game where you will be unable to break them down until you unlock the dimensional claw time power which then allows you to transport various items through the nether realm to then subsequently blow it open. So my first tip here for you is don't spend an unnecessary amount of time trying to figure out how to open gates, jump to far away platforms or engage with destructive looking walls. That is only until you reach chapter seven out of a possible nine chapters in the main storyline which is when you will then unlock the final of the six time powers called the fabric of time now once you've unlocked this the whole map is no longer off limits to you and you'll be able to overcome every puzzle and area the game has to offer you by utilizing your time powers incidentally fast travel is very important in this game as the map is so big which is why i'm actually going to put the whole map on your screen right now in 4k resolution as it takes 20 hours to actually unlock it all so take a screenshot with your phone or if you're on your computer right now to refer to it when you do reach a dead end but another tip here for you is when you do unlock a new fast travel location location, make sure you then fast travel back to the Haven, which is your main base, and then unlock the door guarding that fast travel altar. Now that does sound pretty basic, but until you do this, you then won't be able to fast travel from the Haven to far away locations as the gate will be locked, which I learned the hard way, unfortunately for me. Now there's some cool movement options available to you in this game, which I wish I had known earlier on. And the first one here is slightly expanding your field of vision by moving the right joystick on your controller, which will then allow you to see hidden platforms, chests, or traversal options that you can engage with, which is just on your peripherals. You can also crouch in this game by pressing down on your left joystick or S on your keyboard, I believe. But you'll notice you can't actually walk around crouched or stealth in this game. And the way to get around this though is by kind of crouching followed by pressing your slide button, which is a big advantage against certain enemies that have a large aggro radius. And if they capture you, they will then send you to this Mount Calf prison that will knock you back around 10 minutes of game time. So this is good to know. Now, as for parkour, there is no fall damage in this game. So feel free to jump off high platforms, safe in the knowledge that you won't die. And when you do come across a difficult puzzle that requires a lot of hand-eye coordination, just know that you can continually jump against a wall to remain in the same spot until you kind of get your bearings without continually dying over and over again. And if you press down on your controller whilst you're on this wall, Sargon will slide downwards against it, which will reduce your fall time by a solid amount, giving you a little bit more time to plan your next parkour maneuver and remain in control of your movement and this game. Now, as for Athra charges, there's a total of 10 of them in the Lost Crown. And if you're watching this video before playing the game, they are the special moves or unique powers that you can use in and out of combat by equipping a maximum of two in your loadout. Now, it's a pretty basic, simple mechanic as you're able to use these powers by filling up your combo meter, as you can see here, by successfully landing attacks on enemies and parrying their offensive abilities. That said, out of the possible 10 to unlock and to choose from, there's there's only a couple I would actually really recommend you use throughout your time with the game. The first is called the Barman's Breath, which drops a healing zone, which when you stand in it, recovers all of your health. Now, thankfully, this unlocks around two to three hours in the game, and it's a must equip for me as I used it throughout all of the nine big boss battles in the game. And when you do use it in combat, it kind of stops the boss fight phases temporarily, which is very helpful for a quick recovery and breather. I'm not sure if they're gonna patch this, but definitely equip it as soon as you get it. Secondly is Verathagnus's Smite and Arash's Ray, both which are early unlocks as well, and allow you to do damage to several enemies at once with a strike 
that pierces their defenses and a laser bow ability that also does a lot of area damage to enemies and can also be triggered whilst in the air, which is great and offers you a really impactful amount of damage regardless of your position. Of course, try all of these 10 Athra charges out for yourself, but to be honest with you, you can't go wrong with one offensive Athra ability and one defensive Athra ability to have a nice balance playthrough offensively. Now, another game mechanic you do need to be aware of are these amulets, which grant you with passive bonuses that do alter Sargon's playstyle and by extension your own. There's a total of 38 of them in the game where you can equip 12 simultaneously by the end of the game. But again, there's a couple non-negotiables here that should be socketed in your amulet slots as soon as possible as the passive effects that they will generate will compound for you throughout your time with the game and pay you gameplay dividends without even realizing it. Now, the first one is called the Blade Dancer, which thankfully you do pick up as well as a reward early on in the main narrative in the first couple hours. This allows you to land an additional attack at the end of a combo flurry, which when you upgrade it back at the blacksmith, grants you additional attacks and is a must upgrade and equip as an amulet. The second I'd recommend is the Shield of Mithra, which is a reward from one of the possible nine side quests available to you in this game, with this particular quest being issued by Kahiva, the blacksmith herself. Now, this amulet allows you to slow the enemy's movements down on a successful parry. And if you manage to get the perfect parry, it's going to create a time bubble that allows you even more time to do damage to your enemy, which is very impactful against the nine big bosses and their huge amount of damage output and various phases which are significantly challenging in this game. So equip both of these and upgrade them and you'll thank yourself later for doing so. Now, if you've learned something new so far or you're enjoying the video, please do leave a very swift like down below and please do consider using the Andy Reloads credit code next time you're in the Ubisoft store as I get a very small pushback and it's honestly the best way to help support me making videos for you on YouTube. So genuinely, thank you very much. Now, something I didn't engage with for several hours within the game was the free training arena mode offered by Artaban above the Haven. This mode allows you to get to grips with the correct buttons that you need to press in quick succession to activate high damage dealing combos, as well as partake in combat challenges issued by Artaban without the risk of dying. Now, the incentive to complete these challenges isn't just by learning new combo moves, but you are also rewarded with 50 time crystals per challenge, as well as 100 time crystals per time power challenge that you complete, which all adds up to a considerable sum if you do bash them out pretty quickly. This is is going to give you a solid amount of crystals which are the required currency to purchase those amulet upgrades that we just spoke about at the blacksmith as well as other essential offensive and defensive upgrades which you need to get and let's go through some of them now with the first one being the health potion upgrades that you can buy from the mage in the haven because the game will absolutely punish you with intricate puzzles and overpowered boss fights if you haven't increased your base health by purchasing summer petals or upgrading your potion efficiency meaning you can now hold three health pots instead of just one one. So it's another one of those worthwhile investments early on in the game where you'll be patting yourself on the back for doing so 15 hours in. Secondly, I'd really recommend you upgrade your swords and bow quiver at the blacksmith as soon as possible because it's going to increase your damage output, which is fundamentally the key to this game, as well as increase the amount of arrows that you've got available to ping around. Because several times over, I had to retreat back to the whack whack trees to replenish my arrows as I'd actually run out and couldn't use any arrows to activate a specific platform. So I could then progress with the game. The problem, of course, being that after refreshing your health and consumables at that whack whack tree, all the ads and NPCs I then killed had then respawned, which is just kind of a waste of time in total. So upgrade them both. And again, you're gonna be thanking yourself later. Now, whilst we're chatting about offensive damage, let me run you through a few combat tips and tricks that I would have liked to have known earlier. The first is that you can shoot through certain floors at enemies who are above you, which will occur a lot in this game, as well as being able to parry incoming attacks whilst you're in the air, which is particularly useful in boss fights, as you'll find out for yourself. You can also kick enemies enemies off platforms who do seem to take full damage, which you can trigger by sprinting and pressing your standard attack button. I found this particularly fun to do whilst zooming through each level when I couldn't be bothered to re-clear the area. Speaking of which, you can also slide while sprinting, which then allows you to kick enemies up into the air, which is a great way to disrupt their own combo attacks and moves, but also allows you to keep the enemy 
in the air if you time your sword swipes correctly, essentially taking out mid-tier difficult enemies quickly without taking a single hit yourself, which is good to have in your arsenal of potential moves when you're very low on health. Now, there's a lot of secret activities in this game, which I ran past several times over without really knowing what they were there for. And the first one that comes to mind and to look out for are these nine mystery chests, which are identifiable through these empty black altars on the floor in the game. Now, each one of these nine altars requires you to perform a specific move whilst on them, which will then spawn a chest that will then reward you with new outfits, of which there are five in this game, by the way, as well as amulets and diamonds for spending. So when you zoom past one of these altars, make sure you at the very least drop a memory shard screenshot by pressing down on your D-pad so you can then come back to it if you're on a mission or you just can't figure it out at that moment in time. Additionally, there's a lot of hidden rooms or walls that can be broken open. So if you enter a specific area which is clearly empty with nothing in it, there's usually a reason why for that. So take a provisional swipe with your sword at each wall to make sure you're not missing any potential loot inside. Now, when it comes to collectibles and currency, there's a few things here that you need to be aware of. First of all, if you want 100% platinum this game, you can view your current collection of collectibles in each of the 13 biomes or regions on the map by hovering your cursor over each area, as you can see me do here. These include a total of 30 sand vials, which need to be destroyed and provide you with a little bit of info on the Prince of Persia story, prophecy, as well as 57 lore items that give you more of a historical background on the Persian culture in which this game takes place in, which are what these twinkle lights are also on the ground, by the way. So don't run past them and do make sure that you pick them up. We also have 20 Damascus ores and 47 Xerxes coins, which you can use to spend on even more advanced upgrades back at the Haven instead of just using your time crystals. Now, there's quite a few settings that you can turn on in the options menu, which you need to know as it may make the game more enjoyable for you. The first is platform assist which allows you to just skip through certain puzzles or difficult environmental areas that do require a lot of coordination to burn through them. So when this is activated, a portal will become available that will allow you to teleport past this obstacle and continue your playthrough without smashing your controller to pieces. You can also change the custom difficulty of the game if it does become a little too hot to handle, which you may want to consider with some of these boss fights, especially as these settings allow you to increase your Athra combo gain, meaning you can use those offensive and defensive abilities more more frequently, which you will find more enjoyable. Now, I've got another Prince of Persia video for you on your screen here, so give that a click so you can get even more out of this awesome game, and hopefully I'll see you there in just a second. But if you're still here, my thanks to Nika for helping me in early access to make this video for you. Coffee's on her, and I'll see you in that video in just a moment.